Hello and welcome back to a special Halloween themed episode of Take a Side. I'm your host, Max McElroy, and we have an awesome show for you today. With all the action from a variety of sports, be sure to get on to Sided.co or the Sided Debates app to post, comment, and pick your side for a chance to climb that leaderboard and win some Amazon gift cards. Users can earn points by having other people vote and comment and like each other's points. The more engagement the post gets, the more points you earn to inch closer to that $25 Amazon gift card. On Halloween, we had a mix of football, baseball, hockey, soccer, and basketball, which made for an action-packed day of sports. To start out with our first Halloween-themed debate, I'm joined by Isabel Scarborough and Ryan Atchison to debate the scariest division in the NFL. We're halfway into the NFL season, and we have a pretty good idea of the top teams in the league, as each team are establishing themselves as we move into the second half of the season. With many divisions overall looking pretty solid, Ryan, I will start with you. Which division is scariest? I'm going to take the AFC West, and let's just be real. The Chiefs are the one surprise team in that division where no one was expecting them to be at the bottom of the division this year, sitting at 3-4, and four, which their weekly game's coming up against the Giants on Monday night. Now, I'll just say I'm surprised just how good this division has been, with the Raiders currently sitting on top, the Chargers and the Broncos are falling, behind, are falling right behind them. I'm really surprised with these divisions and the AFC West and these teams. And really, it's just, how, how can the Raiders not be better at this point? And how can the Chargers and Broncos and all these teams not be better? This, this whole division has been completely, utterly good with all the teams doing, destroying the AFC West. Two teams currently are right now in the top seven of the AFC uh, conference. And just, I don't know, man. I just, I don't know, Isabel. I mean, what do you think? What, what's your side? I saying? have to go with the AFC North. With the Steelers, the Bengals, the Browns, and most importantly, the Ravens. Ravens right now are a team to be scared of with Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is an amazing quarterback, and they are standing at the top of their division. As well as every single, they are the only division that all have winning teams. Nobody in that division has less than a 500. So tied or winning, their whole division is scary. With the Clevelands and Miles Garrett, he is a force to be reckoned with. He is scary against the quarterbacks. And you have the Bengals. Joe Burrow is new, but he is doing good. And he's shown that the Bengals can and be good in their division. And I think the AFC North is the scariest. Well, let's not forget about Patrick Mahomes. Now, Patrick Mahomes has one of the most turnovers in the NFL right now. But he's still got that it factor. He's going to still be feared by deep opposing defenses in that division. Then you got Justin Herbert. you got... Derek Carr, and now the Broncos got Teddy Bridgewater, who still is a relevant player. He still can drive that force with the Denver Broncos. And then you add on the defensive side, you know, with the Chiefs, you got Frank Clark, Chris Jones, you got Von Miller, which actually was just now traded to the Rams, so he is gone. But you still got on the Chargers, you got Derwin James, you got uh, Joey Bosa. This the, the AFC West just all around is just the division to be in, and no one was thinking that fearing. Everyone was thinking the Chiefs were just going to run away with the division, but that is not the case at all this, this year. And so, to me, that says a mark right there. With the Chiefs being at the bottom and everyone else being at the top, that says something that, hey, this division is legit. This isn't just a hierarchy and top tier where Chiefs are just running away with everything. I think just with all around in football, that's the division right now that every team wants to be in for competitiveness and to really show that they are actually what it takes to be a Super Bowl contender. I agree. You have some good points, but the Steelers, they might have started the season a little bad, but they are now on a three-game win streak. So the Steelers are going to go through the rest of the season. They're hyped. They have a lot of motivation, and they're a scary team now. Especially, you know, Ben, he had a little trouble, but he's coming back strong. They have a good wide receiver core and everything. You take that, and you have – their rivalries they have in that division alone, they're a scary division just with them. The Browns and the Steelers, they have a good rivalry going on. The Ravens and the Browns, they're all alone in the division without the rest of the NFL. They are scary alone. You take that and then you give, again, Joe Burrow. 
he's great. And the Bengals, before, they were not somebody to be scared of. It was the Bengals. They always had a losing record. Them coming up now, I think they are like the Chiefs. They're a scary team. You take that, you take the defense they have and the offense they have. When you actually look at it around, I think they're the scariest in the division. Well, Bengals are actually one of the biggest surprises team. I was really shocked to see the Bengals kind of be at the top, but their defense is still, uh, still a little suspicious on whether or not they're legit. And no doubt, Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow's connection on offense is phenomenal. They are one of the most exciting uh, completion and two couples, basically, together with them being a connection together. Now, Steelers lost Juju, Juju Smith-Schuster to start the, about middle of the year, about week four, week five. And I just don't see, I can't see, there's just a lot of things need to be proved to prove whether or not this AFC North team is the division. The Ravens haven't gotten over the mark at all. Steelers are just not as good as they used to be. The Browns are still unproven. The Bengals are still trying to find a winning team. I think the AFC West has already established that so much that I think that this is the team, this is the vision that you that is going to represent most of the AFC playoff teams. But that is all we have time for today. Uh, stay tuned as next Justin Pottinger will discuss the biggest surprises and disappointments for fantasy football. We'll be right back. For students searching for a way to stay active in an outdoorsy way, the city of Lawrence has bike trails running in every direction. And with the new bike share program, we can stay in shape as we tour the sites of our beautiful city. Clinton Lake is only a short 30 minute bike ride away from Daisy Hill and has the most incredible sunset location in all of Lawrence. Walking campus may give you the KU calves, but biking can give you the KU thighs. Bike Lawrence today. Welcome back. For our next segment, we are joined again by Justin Pottinger to discuss some of the biggest surprises and the bigger disappointments for fantasy football this year. Justin, take it away. It is now officially halfway through the fantasy season, with eight weeks being completed. Looking back on the season so far, these are the players who have really surprised us this year. For starters, Rams wide receiver Cooper Cup has been the biggest surprise so far this year. Arguably the best player in fantasy football right now, Cup has started off the season with record-breaking numbers. With 10 touchdowns in five games with over 100 receiving yards through just eight weeks, Cup is the clear number one biggest surprise so far. My, bi my second biggest surprise is wide receiver Debo Samuel. Debo was listed as an eighth round player before the season started. Now eight weeks completed, Debo is the third overall wide receiver in fantasy. Star tight end George Kittle does come back next week, so we might see a decline here, but so far Debo has been a huge shock to us all. My third player who has completely surprised us is running back Cordero Patterson from the Atlanta Falcons. A player who, hasn't e who wasn't even drafted in the majority of leagues, Patterson now becomes arguably the best waiver wire pickup of the year. Patterson currently sits as the eighth overall running back and shows off his running and catching abilities weekly. With a Falcons team that plays down a lot, the receiving part of his game comes in perfectly. Patterson also receives a lot of goal line looks, which is fantastic for him. There has been players so far this year who have caught us all by surprise, although there has also been players who have honestly disappointed us each and every week, starting with Washington's running back Antonio Gibson. Gibson was a third round pick in most fantasy drafts. Throughout eight games, however, Gibson is only ranked 19th overall for running backs, recording only three touchdowns on the year. Many believed Gibson would have a full workhorse style season, but so far that just hasn't been the case. The last player I'm going to talk about is Bears wide receiver Allen Robinson. Robinson has been one of the biggest disappointments this year. After being a tremendous option last year, Robinson now sees really useless in this new Chicago offense. After being drafted in the fourth round for most, Robinson is almost droppable in eight to ten man leagues. That is what we got so far eight weeks in. Those are my players who have busted and players who have looked fantastic so far this year. You may not hear it at first, but it's there. Our chant, rising. On this summit, callings converge. Voices unify into a chorus. That sounds out for good. 
for greatness. Can you hear it? Big news came out on Sunday when Falcons star wide receiver Calvin Ridley announced he is taking a break from football to focus on mental health and his own well-being. This news is quite shocking, and as Justin talked about earlier, for fantasy football fans and owners, it might be surprising, but hopefully Ridley finds help he is seeking, and we will see him back on the field soon. And now switching into our third and final Halloween theme debate, I am joined by Jack McGar and Jackson Reed to discuss which NBA teams are tricks and which ones are treats. There have been a few early surprises in the NBA this year, and Jackson and Jackson are here to say whether this team is just a trick, meaning they're not as good as the record shows, or if they are a treat and they are serious top seed playoff contenders. All right, and here we go to start us off. Jack, are the Charlotte Hornets a trick or a treat? I really like the Hornets this year. I think they're a treat. I did not think that going into the season. I thought they were going to be a play-in team at best. But LaMelo Ball looks to have already stepped up on that second level in just his second year. He looks like possibly an all-star this year, along with Gordon Hayward after his injury last year and his injury problems throughout the years. I think Kelly Oubre was a great pickup for them on the he doesn't play as great of defense as they would have liked, but neither does the team. He does bring that defensive presence that they're looking for, and he even provides double-digit points per game. I think, I think they're the real deal. I think you are totally correct. You hit on it perfectly. Kelly Oubre, a great addition. Gordon Hayward playing a little bit better, and this team can really score the ball. The yeah. mellow ball is really coming into his own, like you said, all-star potential. I think he'll get there, especially this year. Um, I think the Hornets are the real deal. If, I mean, if they can fix a little bit of defensive issues, this team is really going to contend for probably a top three or four seed in the Eastern Conference, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The Atlanta Hawks, are they a trick or a treat? I think the Hawks are a treat as well. I think the Hawks were already kind of projected to be a four, five, six seed, wherever you want to put them in the Eastern Conference this season. I think they have what it takes to go far in the playoffs, too. I mean, they did it last year, although, of course, there were injuries to a couple teams here and there. But, they, I mean, they did it last year. I, I don't see any reason they can't do it again. I think the Atlanta Hawks are a great team. I think you have to look at Trey Young. Obviously, I mean, that's a guy that everyone's going to want to talk about. Of course. But you're going to talk about John Collins. You're going to talk mm -hmm. about all these guys. Kevin Herter, too. Look, this is a team that has an insanely good young core, and they're only getting better. And I expect them to take a huge stride this year. I think I'm with you again. I know it's supposed to be a debate show, <laughs> but we are pretty, pretty dead set together. I think the Atlanta Hawks are a treat as well. For sure. All right. And the Brooklyn Nets. A little bit of surprise that they're on here. Are they a trick or a treat? I thought they would be a treat earlier in the season, but looking at what they are now, I think they're a trick this season. I think I think the bench isn't what I, I think everyone thought it was going to be. Patty Mills was a great pickup for them off the bench, and he's in the running for sixth man of the year, but that's about it. I mean, LaMarcus Aldridge might be their best bench player right now, and that's that's a little scary. I, I mean, when it comes to looking at the NBA and looking at a top playoff team, mm. or a top playoff seed, rather, you just have to look at talent. And this team yeah. has talent all over the board. I think the Nets, you know, they're skidding a little bit, but hopefully Kyrie resolves some issues. Harden's exactly. going to come into his own. Durant's going to come into his own. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a team that you're looking at as, like, they're a three seed, very similar to what the Bucks were last year, a three seed with yeah. the finals run potential. I think the Brooklyn Nets are exactly that. So I'm not going to exactly – I'm not going to punt on the Nets yet. To, okay. me they're, to, them, to me, they're a treat. All right, and lastly, out of the Eastern Conference, the Chicago Bulls, are they a trick or a treat? I think they're a treat as far as the regular season goes. I don't know about playoffs yet. I mean, they, their schedule in the next coming games are all playoff caliber teams and all made the playoffs last season. I think up until Thanksgiving, they play each and every game, they play a playoff team. So I think what they do in those games will kind of decide if they're a trick or a treat. But I'm buying in right now. I think it's the perfect time to buy into the Chicago Bulls right now, especially because, like you said, we don't know if they're really that great, but we're going to find out pretty yeah. quickly here. They play a lot of really good teams, um, and especially like now that you're looking at the playoff success that we're talking about, mm -hmm. it's really – you're going to have to see where they stack up in uh, like regards to the Eastern Conference. There's a ton of top-heavy teams. Yeah. So we'll see regards to the playoffs, but as far as the regular season, this team is for sure in the playoffs, in my opinion. I'm buying in on the Chicago Bulls for sure. All right, now switching over to the Western Conference. Jackson, are the Minnesota Timberwolves a trick or a treat? These Minnesota Timberwolves are absolutely a trick. Come on, like you can't be serious. Anthony Edwards, great player. Carl Anthony Towns, great player. But the fact that I can't name anybody else off the top of my head other than D'Angelo Russell right now, like this team is not deep. They can't really score that well. They can't defend that well either. I really, I, I think I'm not buying into Minnesota, especially in a very good, deep Western mm -hmm. Conference. I'm just not buying into Minnesota this year. I am buying into the Timberwolves this year. I think with the three-headed monster of Russell, Edwards, and Towns, like you mentioned, they can score 80 points plus per game if they really want to. If they are, if they're all playing to their 
potential in every game. And I think their defense has definitely gotten better from last season where they were allowing 110, 120 points a game. I think, I mean, they held the Bucks to 101, I think, last game that they played against them. So I think the Timberwolves definitely have what it takes to make the playoffs this year. All right, now the Sacramento Kings. Are they a trick or a treat? This is another tr- trick. I'm sorry, I almost said treat. It, they are not a treat. Don't get – it's like candy corn. No one likes mm-hmm. candy corn, right? Okay. Sacramento Kings, absolutely a trick. This team, they can't score the ball. Great, defensive, great defensively, and, you know, maybe we can trust that old adage of, you know, defense wins championships. Mm-hmm. But when we're talking in a regular season where they have to face the Lakers, they have to face the Suns, they have to face all the, the Warriors too, all these top-heavy Western Conference teams, I don't think the Sacramento Kings have anywhere near the offensive firepower it takes to score. Because right now their leading scorer is Harrison Barnes. You can't rely on Harrison Barnes to score you 23 points a game for 82 games. It's mm-hmm. just not, it's not feasible. I'm buying into the Kings right now. I think their defense has gotten so, so much better than it was before. I think that's really what they were missing. I think their offense with Fox, when he gets kind of in his own stride, Barnes, healed. Rashawn Holmes is a great, uh, you know, underrated player for them, too. I agree. I think definitely with their defense that they're putting on right now, I think they have what it takes to at least make the play in and then get to that 7 or 8 seed in the playoffs. All right. And now the Memphis Grizzlies. Jack, are they a trick or a treat? I love the Grizzlies. I, I, I'm 100% bought into the Grizzlies. I think with John Morant at the helm, he's leading the league in points in the paint per game right now. He's a guard. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen that ever. So I think with John Moran at the helm and Valanciunas, oh no, I'm sorry, Stephen Adams now, they got rid of Valanciunas. I think with their defense and their young players that are continuing to develop, I think they have what it takes to make a very far run in the Western Conference. I think Minnesota, Minnesota I almost said <laughs> Memphis. Memphis is a great team, and John Moran is great at the helm like we've been talking mm-hmm. about. But And Dylan Brooks also coming into his own. Yeah. He's had a little bit of injury problems so far this mm-hmm. year, but hopefully that gets all resolved and whatnot. But Memphis is a team where when you stack them up against the Western Conference, like I've been talking about, this is a team that just really doesn't stack up to the talent level that the Warriors, the Lakers, the Suns, and even even maybe even Sacramento, too. I think Sacramento's a more talented team than Memphis is. Really? So, I mean, we'll have to see how Memphis plays, and, you know, maybe it's one of those examples where it's a team that really meshes together mm-hmm. well, and we may be really surprised by Memphis, but right now I'm not going to buy into Memphis just yet. Okay. I'm saying they're a trick. All right, and the last team that we're doing today, the Portland Trailblazers. Are they a trick or a treat? I think they're a trick right now. I think with Damian Lillard not playing to his 100% caliber that we're used to seeing him at, the Trailblazers have fallen. I think everyone kind of expects that, but when you have one guy that needs to be your entire offense or else you're going to lose games, that's really scary. I mean, even if he got hurt, of course, hopefully he doesn't, but if he doesn't play well or he gets hurt, that team is not going anywhere. I think they're a trick for sure. I think you're exactly right. I'm not buying into the Portland Story Blazers either. They're one Damian Lillard off night away from losing a game. <laughs> yeah. Like they don't have they don't have the firepower to compete in the West or the East. They just mm-hmm. have Damian Lillard. CJ McCollum has kind of been on that little bit of like a little down slope, little landslide, yeah. if you will. I think they need to they're in need of a fresh face and Chauncey Billups could be that for the Blazers, but I'm talking player regards, yeah. roster regards. They need to mix up in Portland and I don't think this is the year for them. I agree. All right, and that wraps it up for our show today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, as I said already, be sure to create an account and post, comment on a wide variety of sports debates. Check out Sided.co or the Sided Debates app for fresh content daily. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter at TakeAsideKU. On our Twitter, we post content from our shows as well as other debates for everyone to vote and comment on. And our Instagram is also at TakeAsideKU. And on top of our show's content, we also are doing live streams and leave our opinions on breaking news around the league. So be sure to check us out on there too. For all of us here at Take Aside, thank you for watching and we will see you next week. Again, is probably the most athletic player on this team. And why you would use that, especially when one call can be just a horrible, horrible situation for them. I don't think that's going to